First of all, I think quiet creatives have an opportunity for surprise that sometimes more boisterous creatives don't have. Um, I find that when you're the extrovert creative person, those ideas are always just kind of coming out and, you know, they're, they're big and they're fun and they're exciting. But I think when you're a quiet creative and you suddenly lay out your concept and your idea and your vision for what you want to try and accomplish, people get really excited. They're like, I didn't see that coming from this particular person. Welcome to Real Creative Leadership, a video podcast produced by The Stoke Group and hosted by me, Adam Morgan. Now, leadership isn't a one-size-fits-all, and neither are the members of your creative team. Some of us are extroverts with big personalities, and others are what we call quiet creatives. These are the introverts. And though they may be quiet, introverts bring a unique advantage to teams. And like our guests, they make strong, influential creative leaders. Today, I am talking with Jeff Paris, Vice President and Executive Creative Director at Master Control. Jeff leads a team of creatives largely made up of the quiet variety. So today we're digging into how creative leaders can inspire quiet creatives and encourage them to become creative leaders themselves. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Hey, Adam, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. And I'll try not to be too quiet. <laughs> and Jeff and I go way back, way, way, way back. I mean, when is it even, like the 90s? I think it was, yeah. <laughs> Good gravy, that makes me feel old. We, we've been around for quite a while, but uh, anyhow, Jeff and I worked at an agency together, partnered on many awesome projects, had many crazy adventures out doing radio recordings and TV spots and all sorts of crazy stuff. So I'm super excited to have you here on the show. I appreciate you joining us. It's fun to be here. Okay, well, to start, let's have you tell our audience about you and your relationship with creative leadership so we can get to know you. Um, yeah, I have been working in marketing and advertising and public relations for, I don't know, um, 35 years now. So I've been around for a while. A big chunk of that time was working in agencies as a creative leader, as a group creative director, as um, an executive creative director. I left the agency world about five years ago um, to move into something that seemed completely new and different, and that was going on the client side. Um, and since then, we have built kind of an agency inside our company. We really take on that idea of um, the things you learn in an agency are really valuable to a company, and so we've really tried to make that a part of how we um, organize our creative teams. And I don't know whether I gravitate toward quiet creatives or quiet creatives gravitate towards <laughs> me, <laughs> but it seems like much of my career, the, the teams and the creatives that I've worked with have... Um, have often been in that category of quiet creatives. You were mentioning a scale. I think I'm somewhere on that scale. I don't think, I'm certainly not the most extroverted creative um, that you'll find, but I'm also not totally a quiet creative, but I certainly understand their perspective and uh, really enjoy working with that type of creative. And as we've talked about this before, you know, in preparing for this, this, uh, this interview here, it's an interesting question of like what, what, what attracts more quiet creatives to it? Because you know, as I've thought about it, you know, I think about what I call the creative cave, which is where when we do our work, we go off into that cave, get into that flow state, and just really like we want to shut out all of the influence around us, so we can really focus on the design, the writing, the whatever it is that creative act that you're doing. And I think many of us get used to that solitary cave as like a place of productivity and where we're doing well, at least early on in our careers when we're, we're building up the skills. And then as we get into leadership, it gets tricky because you, you want to go back to that cave. So what is it in your mind, like what, for you, what do you think makes people a quiet creative? So for me, um, it's interesting that you mentioned the kind of cave. I think a lot of quiet creatives do like that idea of being isolated. I also have noticed though that a lot of quiet creatives like being around other people they just have to have time to really process and contemplate and think about things. I think that quiet creatives, one of their strong suits is that, and I, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about that later on, but um, one of their strong suits, I think, is they have this really strategic approach to creativity. They, they think through what they want to communicate, how they want to present ideas and concepts, 
And I think that's where that kind of creative cave comes into play. They need that time to really think through the project and what it is they want to present um, in a larger in a larger setting. Yeah, that's totally fair. It may not be, you know, someone may say, oh, quiet creatives, introverts, and that's not necessarily always the case. Um, and I'll let you respond to that as well, but like in my experience, I found some people who just, like you said, that's that strategic thought. Like they just want to think it through a little bit more, whether they're an extrovert or an introvert. And so I've known to like not call them out in a meeting of like, hey, what are your thoughts? Because they like want to absorb it and think about it. Um, whereas there are others who are just like, they'll just rapid fire tell you an answer right on the spot, whether it's good or bad. You know, that's just kind of the knee jerk reaction. But do you think like remote work has changed any of this? Or do you think it's, it's not just introvert, extrovert, like there's more to it than that? I think, uh, first of all, I think there is more to it than just introvert and extrovert. Mm -hmm. um, but um, quiet creatives are introverted. I think um, COVID and remote work, uh, a lot of quiet creatives appreciated that, uh, an opportunity to kind of stay away from the fray. On the flip side of that, a lot of our creatives like to work with another partner or another person to kind of develop ideas and really get to something that they're proud of. And so I think there is still this, um, this desire on the part of quiet creatives to be around other creatives. And frequently those other creatives are quiet creatives. They're, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're, they're very good at um, stepping back and not having to have the big ideas right away. And so I think they like working together in, in those ways. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if, it, what do you think about the difference between your experience in agency versus in-house at brands? Like, is it the same thing or is it different? So it's really been interesting for me to come on the client side. I have brought some people with me from the agency. <laughs> so some of my favorite client creatives um, now work with me here at Master Control. So that part is really fun for me. But I've also hired creatives since I've been here. And and there were creatives who were here when I got here that are still here. And of my creative team, we have eight people on my creative team. And of that team, I would say that um, seven of them are lean more towards that creative, that quiet um, kind of side of creativity. And then we have one who is really that, you know, extrovert, kind mm -hmm. of loud, fun, brings a lot of excitement to the um, to the 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 opportunity. So for me, I haven't seen the difference, but I think part of that between agency and, and um, client side, I think part of that has to do with the fact that um, I came from agency world. And so I have just organized my life around an agency type attitude. And I brought those quiet creatives with me because I like working with them. And I tend to hire that type of creative. Um, and so I really haven't noticed a difference. Um, I think on the agency side, you really do get to see a lot of different creative leadership styles on client sides. And I'm not sure, sometimes I think there is a big difference between agency and um, client side. But for the most part, I haven't noticed that difference as I've made the move. Yeah, and as you talk about that, it makes me think about environments. like. Also having, I did 19 years of agency life before, you know, the last decade at, at uh, in-house at a brand, but there was something always about an agency that had that energy where it's like, everyone wanted to sit by the creative department because there was this, this, I don't know, intangible energy that you'd get. And I think it's even in in-house, like when we have our brand and creative team, you know, you, you understand that people want to be by it, but it's not necessarily that it's a bunch of extroverts out there partying, right? Like, I wonder if there's more to it of like the, that energy that people are getting from, from the creative department. Yeah, that is, the, um, I find the same thing even with quiet creatives, people want to interact with them. And I think part of that comes from the, the time that quiet creatives take to generate ideas and to really present those ideas in kind of meticulous ways. Um, frequently I find quiet creatives are very, a little bit minimalist in their approach to how they present their ideas. And it tends to be kind of meticulous and they like to have things done in a certain way. And I think a lot of groups in um, companies in particular, agencies that might be a little different, 
a lot of teams in the marketing group um, don't really have that that training or that ideology of creating ideas and figuring out how to make them come to life. And so I think there is something about that that um, draws everyone in the marketing department to the creative team. And in our case, everyone in the company. Um, it's surprising to me how much our executives love working with the creative team, um, how much other organizations in the company yeah. like working with the creative team. I think it does bring a um, kind of a new idea of what innovation and creativity looks like. And I guess that's totally fair. Even now when we're mostly remote, I imagine for a lot of the people listening here, that it's like the things that attract both us as creatives and also people to the creative department are the ideas, the designs, yeah. the stories. You know, it's, it's like it lights up your brain. It makes you excited and makes you want to think about things and see things and feel things. So I, I'm sure that's the energy, not that it's like a bunch of extroverts partying, you know, yeah. off in the creative department. Yeah, totally agree with you on that. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, so and you started to get in the beginning into it, but what are other advantages of being a quiet creative? Yeah, so um, first of all, I think quiet creatives have an opportunity for surprise that sometimes more boisterous creatives don't have. Um, I find that when you're the extrovert creative person, those ideas are always just kind of coming out and, you know, they're, they're big and they're fun and they're exciting. But I think when you're a quiet creative and you suddenly lay out your concept and your idea and your vision for what you want to try and accomplish, people get really excited. They're like, I didn't see that coming from this particular person. And so I think there's an element of surprise that people, um, yeah. that people really appreciate when qu quiet creatives start to enter the conversation. Um, it's, you know, it's that concept of surprise and delight. And I think a lot of quiet creatives are really good at doing those, um, those two things. So I think that's a big, um, a big benefit. I mentioned that I think a lot of quiet creatives are minimalistic or mm. are drawn to minimalist ideas. Um, if you come to our office and look at the desks of our quiet creatives, there's almost nothing. In fact, in some of them, it is nothing but their monitors and their computer. And I think that's because they really want to focus everything on their idea. So even if the idea is louder and bigger and bolder, they still want to make sure it's the idea that is core to what they are hoping to accomplish with any, um, any project. And for me, that's that, I, that idea of focusing on the idea and honing in on it and really um, kind of filtering out things to make it as strong as possible is a big benefit of quiet creatives. The other thing that I think is interesting about quiet creatives, they're incredible listeners. Like they want to hear what the strategy team is saying, what the demand gen team is saying. They want to develop things that respond to what they're hearing from the organization, from other people in the organization. And I think that ability to listen and then to take that and turn it into um, ideas that are unexpected and interesting is a, is a real uh, value that quiet creatives have. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, for those quiet creatives out there, you see your benefits, the, all the value you bring to a team. <clears throat> now, I wanna switch a little bit because you had mentioned that whatever it was, seven out of eight on your team were quiet creatives. And now let's focus more of like from a leadership perspective. So let's say you're a creative leader and you have a team and you have a bunch of quiet creatives. So what are some advice that you can get, what's advice you can give us on how to keep that type of personality engaged? Like is there, are there unique tricks that you've seen over your years of experience to, to help with those teams? Yeah, I think the first thing you have to really work on developing is trust. Quiet creatives really have to trust you because frequently, they're not really that concerned about whether they're presenting the creative. In fact, a lot of times they don't necessarily want to present creative. They want to develop the creative and help their leaders sell the ideas. Um, and so if you don't have trust and they don't believe that you are going to give their creative ideas the, the kind of credit that it deserves, um, 
that for me becomes a problem. You really have to try and develop those trusts. So how do you do that? I meet with all of my creatives on a very regular basis and those meetings are frequently not, they're just a check-in. It's not like we have a serious agenda or we're trying to figure things out. Um, it's just an opportunity to talk with the creatives. And by doing that and developing that trust relationship, they become more willing to tell you about things that maybe they don't like or things they really would like to pursue, um, that type of thing. Because a lot of times they don't like to talk to you about what's really on their mind. And so I think you have to develop that trust. That's a, that's a really mm. big, important part of working with quiet creatives. I also think you have to notice when a quiet creative is really proud of their work. They tend to not make a big deal about what they contribute to the organization, but I find that frequently they have things that they're really proud of, and they will not tell you the things that they're really proud of. You kind of have to start to get the clues from them of mm -hmm. what things they're, they're really excited about. And it's really important that you acknowledge that um, pride and that excitement and that you share that with other people in the organization. So that for me is another thing that helps keep quiet creatives motivated is to make sure you're celebrating them for the things they are really proud of. There are things that they work on that you know, it's good work, they like doing it, um, but it's not the thing that they're really most proud of. Figuring out the things that quiet creatives are super proud of and then celebrating those things is a great way to keep um, them motivated. And obviously projects. Um, when I worked in the agency world, a lot of times it's easy for the, the more extroverted creatives to be assigned the, you know, big flashy projects. Um, with quiet creatives, I think you have to say, no, they have a skill set that would be really valuable on this, um, this project. And so you kind of have to watch to make sure you're just not throwing the big, um, flashy projects to the more extroverted creatives on your team. Yeah. It's almost like creating space for them, creating opportunity yeah. for them is where probably where you build more of that trust you were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's good advice for leaders. Now, what about, <clears throat> let's say you got a quiet creative moving up the ranks. How do you convince them to jump into leadership? Because it's not a natural fit sometime for many of them. Yeah, and, and that is totally, um, that's totally something that I am thinking about right now. And the reason I say that is obviously I'm um, uh, old enough that I'm starting to think about the end of my career and how do I start to look at um, not having all of the leadership responsibility in the creative department. And so I am working right now with quiet creatives to bring them into leadership roles. And a little bit, you kind of have to push them off a cliff um, because they will be uncomfortable and awkward. And frequently they will tell you that I don't want a leadership role. I'm perfectly happy being a great designer or a great writer. Um, but I also find that once you push them off the cliff, they start to say, I think I can do this. And I find that quiet, creative leaders are frequently... Um, they, they become partners in ways that some other creative leaders don't. And so I think they're, they're really valuable from that standpoint. And if you can start to build those partnerships with other people on the team, whether it's your project management team, whether it's, you know, your events team, whoever it is, if you can start to build those partnerships with quiet creatives and just send them off on their own, that's a little bit of the push them off the cliff, mm -hmm. um, say, you got to get this project done. You're in charge. You get to make all the decisions, those types of things. I, it, it starts to build confidence. And like I say, I'm right in the middle of that right now. And it's, it can be challenging, but at the same time, it's also really fun. And it's fun to see people step up in their careers and start to do things that maybe, um, they, they haven't done in the past. I will say this, even when they become leaders, they don't want the leadership to interfere with their creative opportunities. And so 
sometimes it's hard to get them to work with another designer or another writer to uh, get a project done rather than doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. They really want to kind of take on those projects themselves. And so it can sometimes be a little bit hard to get them to be that leader that is guiding other creatives rather than just doing the work themselves. It comes back to that idea of they like to, you know, sit back with no one around and figure out a creative challenge. Um, and so that's, that I think is something that's difficult to do with quiet creatives. Yeah. The allure of the cave is so strong. <laughs> It is so strong. I'm mean, even just listening to you. You said, I'm in the middle of this. You've been doing it like you've been leading for decades. You're, you're far beyond the cliff. And yet you're still feeling that like, maybe I don't want that. Maybe I want to go back to that cave. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's stuff, true. Right? And it's tricky. I think that's a tricky thing because one, if you feel that draw, you got to be careful you're not micromanaging and doing, trying to do it yourself and making the team do it your way. Like you get very, very cautious of that. And then number two, like you just need to like understand like a good thing of leadership. It's really hard to delegate. It really is. It is. And to let others do it and trust them too. So it's it's hard. It's hard to, to do both sides. Like trust your leadership and also build that trust without being like, no, here's how you do it. Here's how I, I'm going to the cave. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's absolutely true. And I also think um, like quiet cr creatives tend to have a hard time giving feedback. Like they mm -hmm. don't feel the need to tell someone else what to do. And so getting them to change that mindset to say, as a leader, that is your job, is to tell people how to make their work better, tell people how to um, you know, meet the needs of the creative brief in, an, in a more meaningful way, how to change things. And I've noticed that quiet creatives, I've, I've actually had um, a writer just recently tell me, I don't wanna have to tell another writer how to fix their writing. Um, <laughs> and that's someone who I know is going to be a great, great creative leader eventually, but that's one of the things that we kind of have to work on is, no, this you do kind of have to tell people how to make their writing better or how to make their idea more, um, more relevant to the project that we're working on. So um, I think that desire to back away and to your point, um, head to the, the cave is a real thing that um, quiet creatives have to deal with. Oh, it is so true. The other thing that's interesting, that the conversation that I've had many, many times now, yes, this is going, if you're gonna become a creative leader, that's your job. You have to guide the work, you have to show vision. You don't have to micromanage, but you do have to direct, right? Right. But also, if someone doesn't want to do that, I, I also want to give the caveat here that you don't have to become a creative leader. If you want to stay in the cave and you absorb it, stay there. And that's totally fine. You can be a very well-paid senior creative just doing that. And that is a totally great choice. I absolutely agree with that statement. And I think a lot of quiet creatives uh, struggle with that. They feel like, well, if I'm going to succeed in my career, I have to keep moving into new roles and moving up the chain, but let's face it, in organizations, in agencies, in companies like ours, creative ideas will always be as valuable as a leadership skill. Um, if you are a really great creative and can consistently bring interesting ideas, can, can consistently get those ideas produced, that is an unbelievably valuable skill to organizations and to agencies. So it's true, you don't have to feel like you need to move up into leadership. Um, it's one of the conversations I've had a lot with some of the people that I'm working with right now is to say, you don't have to do this if you don't want to, so let's talk through that. Yeah. And some people point blank told me, I don't wanna tell other people what to do. I just want to do my work. So yeah. uh, if you want to be a I'm leader, you got to get past that. We, we yeah. got to work. Yeah, on you that. Do. If you want to be a leader, that has to change a little bit. Yeah. Well, let me just zag a little bit in. So we talked about, you know, what we can do as leaders for our teams or what, you know, the quiet creatives need to do to become leaders. But what about other parts of the organization? How do you get, you know, reaching beyond the creative department? How do you get other marketers or business leaders or developers or web people or whatever else it is to 
understand the value of quiet creatives and to build broader, more inclusive culture and teams by including them in it? it that's a really interesting question. When I saw that on kind of the, the outline of questions that we were talking about, I was really fascinated by that. And this is one area where I think there is a difference between agency world, at least in my experience, with coming to master control. Um, in agency world, I think um, quiet creatives can get lost a little bit when it comes to their presence in the larger scope of things. Um, here at Master Control, for me, it's been a lot easier to introduce creatives to our executive team, for example, yeah. who then start to find out they like these people, that um, when you get a little bit of a chance to talk to them, they're interesting, they're generally, they generally have really great kind of dry senses of humor. Um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so executives tend to kind of warm up to them um, and are interested in hearing what they think and how, um, for us, our executives frequently are working with the creatives for presentations and that sort of thing. And they really start to rely on the creative team for advice and guidance. And so that for me is a, a great way to start to get the rest of the organization to think about it. I do think you have to protect your quiet creatives. They don't want to be in every meeting. They don't want to have to deal with the business side of things. Um, there are a lot of things that are that they just aren't interested in. On the flip side, and frequently, they don't even necessarily, I mentioned this before, they don't even necessarily want to present their own creative. They mm -hmm. would just even say, here's what we have. It's your job to go sell the work. <laughs> Um, but on the flip side of that, I also find that if they are in the meeting, even if I end up presenting creative that they've worked on, when they are in the meeting and you acknowledge that this, that you're presenting their work, they will start to open up during the course of the presentation and they will add color commentary and they'll suggest things and they'll um, point out nuances in what's happening in the creative, that sort of thing. And that, for me, is a great way to start to build um, confidence and courage in quiet creatives so that in the future they will want to present their own work and stand up in front of a group and, and really showcase what they're doing. Oh, those are two great ideas. Well, thank you. And I guess let's just, for, for the end here, as we're, as we're coming to a close, what's, what advice do you have for someone who's new to creative leadership? Like, what should they work on? What should they try? What should they for themselves, not like that they need their boss to do anything, but just on their own, how they can grow a little bit, be ready for leadership. Yeah, the first thing I would say is make sure you understand the business side of the equation. I think as creatives, it's easy for us to not have to focus on that. And I still don't think it has to be your primary focus as a leader. But you have to understand the business side of the creative equation. Um, so really being engaged in those meetings that are frequently painful and boring and that you don't want to be engaged in, really being engaged in those meetings and try to understand where everyone's coming from a business perspective so that you can relate creative activities and efforts to the larger business concern. The other thing I will say that I think um, has benefited me in my career is trying to understand the newest, latest, and greatest technology, but never losing sight of the fact that old-fashioned storytelling is what makes great creative. So we all have to, I mean, I started in the marketing world when you know, you sent out for type and everything got pasted up in a layout and then you sent your paste ups out to the printer. Um, you know, that's so outdated at this point that you can't even do that anymore. And now as we move into AI and generative AI, those types of things, I think it's important that we all understand how those types of technologies are going to change our lives as we move forward. But when you do that, it's easy to forget that Creatives at their core are the storytellers of our society. And that's just as important in, in marketing as it is in um, any other creative endeavor. 
And so I think managing those two ideas of never losing sight of what makes a great story and how you tell a great story um, is core, but also being able to tell those great stories using new technologies. And you don't always have to use those new technologies, but you should definitely be aware of what's happening in the world of creativity. Oh, that's great. Thank you. This has been such a great discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah, I want to just thank you, thank you for joining us today on, on Real Creative Leadership. It's been a pleasure to talk about this topic and learn a little bit more about it. Great. Thanks for having me. Okay, so as closing, Jeff, how can our viewers follow you or connect with you or learn more about you? What are you, what, what websites or things do you want to share? Yes, so you can always follow me on, um, on LinkedIn, but uh, I invite people to follow me on Instagram. My personal account is at Art Lobster. But I also have a... Um, uh, There's a uh, story right there. There is a story right there. <laughs> well, this has been such a pleasure, Jeff, to have you here on the show. What amazing advice. What a great conversation. I really, really, truly appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. It's been really great to be here. Thanks for having me. Real Creative Leadership is produced by The Stoke Group, a full-service digital marketing agency that specializes in content marketing, video, and interactive experiences. If you're looking for a partner to build a strategy and content that delivers, visit thestokegroup.com and connect today. Thanks for watching.